So our next speaker is Mangpo Pilimthana. Sorry, Po Thilimthana. Yeah, a little better that time. Um, uh, this talk is the one that appears to me, at least, to be the one that's uh, probably most interest to uh, the students in, in my classes right now. So maybe I'll make them watch this talk. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, so, uh, um, so I'm a grad student at UC Berkeley, but I'm now a visiting student at UW. And this project I've been started a few years ago, and, and it's the, the project is about a system that can automatically generate hints or guidance to students who are working on racket programming assignment. And this system is actually used in a real course at UC Berkeley which is the introductory programming course. On average, there are about 1,600 students per semester. And in the first half of the course, the student use Python to finish their programming assignment. And then the course introduced them to a functional programming language, which is Racket. So the next two assignments, it's done in Racket. And our hint generation system it is used for those assignments. So I started this project um, because I met with another a student who is a TA for this course for many years. And we discussed this about like, what are the challenges in teaching such a massive course? And one of the problems is that, despite there are many resources for students to get help, they are often not accessible. For example, there are so many students in a class, and let's say you are doing your program assignment, but you get stuck, so you could go to office hour. But you might have to wait for a very long time to get help. So one of the ideas that we came up with is that, can we build an automated system that can give hints to the student when they are doing their assignment and they get stuck, and then they can ask and get help right away. So to design the system, we have these three important goals. So the first goal is to make sure that the hints are useful, but do not give away answers because we still want students to learn from doing the assignment themselves. Second, the hint system should be robust, meaning that when the students need help, then the system can generate hints most of the time, unless the students do not want to use the system. And then third, the system should be easy to use and maintained by the instructors. So before we um, built our system, we essentially analyzed the past data, basically all the students from the previous offering, and categorized the incorrect programs submitted by the student into different categories. So the first categories are programs that contain syntax misconception. Um, in Racket in particular, that's mean misuse of parentheses, of course. <laughs> so this one doesn't include trivial mistake where you miss the open parent or closing parent, but misplace them. The second categories are programs that are almost correct, but still contain some minor mistake like off by one error or miss some base cases. And then the rest of the mistake goes to the third categories. We developed three different techniques to handle these three common mistakes. So let's take a look at the first category. So for syntactic misconception, let's take a look at an example that contains such a mistake. So here's the racket program, and the mistakes here is that the student missing two pair parentheses because this person doesn't actually know how the structure of the conditional statement. And here's the hint generated by our system. It basically points to the student that, hey, you might have misses or have some extra pairs of parentheses in your program somewhere, but not actually tell them how exactly to fix it. And then if the stu student still struggle with this mistake and ask for hint again, the hint will progress and show more detail where it exactly points out which line they should be looking at, and also, uh, along with example of correct syntax and bad syntax that um, specifically correspond to that, this particular mistake. So how do we implement this structural checker to give these kind of hints? It's pretty simple. We just basically apply a simple pattern matching where we have a list of bad patterns, and then we try to match that with the student program, and if it's matched, then we basically print a customized message that related to that particular bad pattern. The second category is programs that are almost correct. Let's take a look at an example. So here is a student program, and there are two mistakes in this program. First, 
um, it's basically that n in the dark red. So that should actually be multiplied by b instead of n. And also, the student missed a base case in this program. And here's the hint generated by our system. So the first thing, it points out that, hey, look at the body expression at line six, uh, what value you should multiply by. So it tells student that there might be some mistake there, but not give away the answer. And then second, it also tells the student that you may have forgotten um, to handle the case where n is equal to zero, but not telling them what value they should return. We built this repair synthesizer um, based on a mutation-based approach that used in a Python introductory programming assignment. The key concept of this approach is that you simply uh, take the student program and then try to mutate the student program until you find a correct version. And th this mutation basically follow or like um, it's by like it's determined by the mo the error model or mutation rules provided by the instructor. So to use this particular system, you go into um, the system and basically have to modify the mutation function to mutate different types of AST nodes in the student program. So that's mean this instructor would have to know the mutation functions pretty well and also the utility function that they can use to implement the mutation. So typically, an implementation of a, one mutation function for one question would take about 300 lines of code. And so that's mean it's really hard to maintain and understand what the mutation code is actually doing. And give. And also in one question, you would need more than one mutation function. So what we do is that we take this concept, but we have a much cleaner way to specify an error model or a mutation rule. So in our case, you basically define the context and you basically say that, hey, I want to mutate that question mark in this multiplication expression. The question mark have to match the mutate from. In this case, it's arg1. It means the argument one of the function. And we want to try to mutate that to arg0 of the function. Um, you can optionally specify the hint message. That means if we apply this particular rule, we're going to print this message out to the student. So let's take a look. Here is the student program, as you've seen earlier. If we apply this particular rule, it's going to match that expression and then change n to b. Because n is arg1 and b is arg0 of the function. Now let's take a look at another rule. Here's the rule to um, handle the base case for a function. In this one, you can see the context will match the entire function called pal. And we would like to mutate um, that question mark is basically the body of the function. That have to match dollar $x. A dollar $x means it can actually match anything. And then we would like to match that to that particular expression, which is like the condition that wrap around the body and have that extra uh, case. So with the same program, if we use this rule, it's going to mutate this program to this particular program. So given all mutation rules and given a student program, we then can generate an exponential number of mutated program. Right? But instead of doing that literally, we generate a meta version of the student program and introduce a choice variable at the top line. So that's the choice variable. Um, the, it's a variable of length equal to the number of incidents of room matches. So in this particular case, we have two room matches. So the first rule, we basically say that, well, if rule one is not applied, we're going to use n, the original variable. If rule one is applied, we're going to use b. And that is decided by the value of c at index 0. And similar for rule number two, um, we basically said, well, we're going to take the original body or the version that add the base case, and that is determined by the value of c at index 1. So with that program, we can then enumerate all possible value of c and find the version or like the value of c that will make the program correct. And in this case, c have to be equal to 1 and 1. That's mean we have to apply both rule 1 and rule 2 to fix the program. So um, because we know that we apply rule 1 and rule 2, then we basically just generate a readable text message to the student accordingly. 
Now, let me dive into a little bit more of correctness. Our system um, supports two kinds of correctness condition. So first one is a soft correctness, meaning that it just tests the student program against a list of test cases provided by the instructor. You can do it um, using a hard correctness condition. That one means that the student program have to semantically equivalent to the instructor. And to check the hard correctness, we basically apply Rosette, which is a silver-aided language embedded in Racket to prove that two Racket's program are equivalent or not. And then now we are move on to the last category, which is the, the hardest one, because this category can include programs that can be far from being correct. So we have to think more about how we would handle this case. And if you look at this particular assignment, the assignment is pretty simple. So each question can be solved by just implement one racket function. So in this racket function, usually it have a similar structure where it have many, many, like multiple cases. Some case you would have to recursively call the function. And some cases are just the base cases. So the idea is that, well, we can analyze the student program and see which cases they are missing and we can report that to the student and then they can think about, do they have that cases? Do they, hand the, do they handle those cases correctly? So here's an example. This is a student program. It's missing some cases and here's the hint generated by our system. So looking at this hint, you can see that for the case A right there, it's similar to the second case the student have, except um, it's a less than equal instead of less than operation. So they will suggest to students that they, they may have to carefully check if their condition is correct or not. And then the case B right here is essentially the negate of the first case and the case A. So this would remind students that, hey, maybe you need the else branch in your program. So how do we implement the case analyzer? We essentially extract the program paths that will lead to the return values from the instructor program and the student program. And we essentially report the cases that the student missed. So in this case, it's the teal and the green color case. And we just simply report that in the hint. Of course, there can be multiple solutions that have different path condition. Um, and of course, this solution is not perfect, but we think that at least given students some idea to progress, it's better than nothing at all. So taking that together, all three techniques, we implement the system and integrate it with the other grader of the course. And the student can ask for hint basically by just provide the hint flag to the other grader. And they would think for a few seconds and then display the message. When the hint is asked, we first actually run Dr. Racket to filter out this, this compile time error. And then we would then invoke the like the three techniques in the chain. And notice that it, for the case analyzer, there might be the case where student programs already contain all the cases. And in such scenario, we would um, display a generic message saying that in your program, there are already like all the necessary cases, but there's still some uh, logic error in your program. So we deployed the system, and here is some stats from spring of 2016. So it turns out that most of the students in the class actually asked for hints, and most of the hints generated are the syntax misconception and the case, missing cases hints. Here's the breakdown by question, and this is ordered by the appearance in the assignment. Now, the most important question that we want to ask is that, does the hint system actually help the student complete their assignments? So to answer this question, we compare the number of attempts that the student took to solve a problem um, across two offering. One offering when we have our hint system and the one that offered previously without our hint system. And it turns out that there is about 18% drop of number of attempts that student um, used to solve the problem. So that seems that our system seems to be 
pretty effective. But what about if we look at each types of hint separately? So for syntactic misconception, we look at the incidents where students ask for a hint. We saw that on average, students struggle for that particular syntax error for about 4.7 attempts, and then they ask for a hint. And then they only took about two attempts after that to actually fix the error. So that seems very promising. For the repair and missing case hints, to analyze, we look at uh, a sample of students that receive the repair hints and subject subjectively evaluate if the hints does contribute to the student final solution. And we found that about 85% of the time, repair hints seems to contribute to the student solution. And about 48% of the time, the missing case hints seems to benefit the student. So overall, we are pretty happy that all kinds of type, all kinds of hints do affect and help students complete the assignment. The second important question that we would like to answer is that does the student use the hint in the right way? Do they try to game the system or not? And according to our analysis, we think it's not because there's only a small portion of students that ask for a tons of hints on a question. But most of the students only ask a few hints on, on a question. So we are pretty happy that our system seems to work and most of the time the student does use the system to enhance their learning instead of trying to gain the system. So with that, um, I would like to take any questions. And if you're interested in using the system, you can come and ask, uh, ask me afterwards also. And uh, if you want to know more about this particular work, there's also a paper that appeared in it exit this year, which is a conference about education in CS. And with that, I can take any question. Um, over there. So I was interested in your statistics. Um, did you notice that once somebody had received a hint for some kind of syntactic error, that they no longer got the same hints on subsequent questions? Um, we already seen that usually the number of syn um, syntax misconception hints go down. Uh, we did not analyze once like each student and follow that. We just look at like the overall stats. Did you compare the two groups? The one that had hints to the one that did not? To see whether the one that got hints, whether their curve was steeper? Uh, we did not do that analysis, but that would be interesting yeah. to look at. All right, so the question is that how hard is to build the second techniques, the mutation-based approach? And so in this particular system, I'm the one who built <laughs> that second one. So I actually did like grab some sample of student incorrect program and analyze what are the usual mistakes that they make. And uh, I usually spend, I would say less than an hour per question to do that. And uh, in terms of how many rules I have, there's about usually like 10 rules in each question. 